and reading through things. All right, we're recording. Thank you. And we're just gonna check the participants to see if we have to bring anyone in from there. There's Dave. And no one's in the attendees yet. So we're gonna go and get started for now because um, I have a five minutes of stuff to do, right? Um, so seeing a presence of a quorum of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council, I'm calling this June 9th, 2022 meeting regular meeting to order at 4.30 p.m. pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. At this time, I'm gonna read the names of the attendees uh, attendees of members of CRC to make sure that we can hear them and they can hear us. So I'm going to start with Pat. Present. And Mandy is present. Pam. Present. And Jennifer. Present. I expect Shalini to show up momentarily um, and we'll watch. There she is. We'll wait till she has her audio set to make sure she can hear us. Shalini, are you present? Yes. There we go. So we've got all five members. Um, we've got John Thompson from the inspection services and Dave Zomek is here too. So we're going to get started because I have a feeling there are CRC members that want to attend something that begins at 630 tonight. So um, we got to end on time. Uh, but with that, we don't have any public hearings. We have two action items. One's more of a discussion. Um, two types of action items with one more of a discussion and then we'll briefly update on ZBA appointments. But um, we're gonna start with the review of the draft language on what we discussed one meeting ago, the way we have been doing this with rental, residential rental bylaw is have a discussion is what we wanna see in the bylaw in certain sections and then see the language later to draft the language based on the discussion we had. So then the next meeting, we review the language. So we're gonna start reviewing the language on application process, fee authority, regulations, transfer of license, and renewal of license. We're gonna spend about a half an hour on that. Then we're gonna to move to the discussion of inspections and other requirements to obtain a license um, and talk about that. We're not gonna probably finish that discussion today. In the work plan, we had two meetings set forward for discussion before we would even see the bylaw language or the draft language based on that discussion, I suspect we will need those two meetings before we um, can really dig into actual language that reflects what we want the bylaw to achieve with respect to those sections. Um, so don't expect to finish the section, the discussion today is what I'm basically saying. Um, and then we will move on to discussion items of residential rental bylaw outreach. We'll do that for about a half an hour after about 45 minutes of discussion of the inspections and other requirements. And then we'll do the updates on ZBA. I'm not sure there are any general public comment minutes um, and the adjourning of the meeting. So that's the schedule plan. We're gonna move right into the review of the draft bylaw language. I am going to say, I see Rob has joined us and Stephanie has joined us. Welcome Rob and Stephanie um, and Chris. I think I've got everyone that has joined us. Um, and so I'm gonna share my screen so that we can all see the draft bylaw language um, so that we know what we're talking about and discussing in each sort of section. And what I tried to do was highlight in blue, um, the new stuff so that you don't have to compare to the old one. Um, and I'll keep doing that. The next time we see it, what's in blue this time will be in black and new stuff will be in blue. Um, I wanna start with the definitions um, and then we'll go into, we'll sort of work in groups the way down. Um, are there any concerns about the two definitions that were added to the bylaw for this round of revisions, the person in charge definition and the student rental definition. And I'll try to monitor all the raised hands. Um, and this is staff and committee members. Everyone feel free to just raise your hand if you've got something to say. So Jennifer. Yeah, this is kind of a question. Um, so although I think I just, as I read it again, can answer it. 
So it says, except where the person in charge is also the property owner, the person in charge will be a responsible adult 25 years of age or older. So um, there's, there have been houses, there's right now one or two on Sunset where uh, let's say the parents bought the house and their son is living there. I don't know if he's on listed as an owner, but he might, anyway, he's considered there's more than four students there because he's it's considered owner occupied. So I guess I would ask John and Rob, is that, that's just a way around it, even though the person's under 25. John? Uh, so we've had a few of these in town where um, folks figure that that's a way around it, but unless the, um, you know, son's name is on the deed or on the mortgage as the owner of the property. That's that's how we look at it. So um, it, it's um, it needs to still be registered as a rental. And regardless, if um, I think I know the house you're talking about, um, he, he can if he's the owner, he can still only rent three rooms, you know, so um, we already have some language about that. Does that answer oh, your question, Jennifer? It does. So I'm actually, oh, okay. Cause I thought if it was owner occupied then the limit of four didn't, so that's good to know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any other thoughts on the definition as drafted for person in charge or student rental? And I, I will point out given Jennifer's question, the student rental definition I tried to um, draft to so that it would include a prior one we've seen was only like one and two families or one, two and three family units or something. So this one includes everyone. But then I tried to include, there were some that talked about owners' families being in and whether that's a student rental or not. So I, I tried to put that clarification into this, um, which is the last sentence, I think, where student rentals would include property where the owner or owner's family members are occupants if they are unrelated to occupants in the dwelling unit. Um, so I tried to, so the way I crafted that was an intent to say, say if I'm, if, if my daughter, when she goes to college, goes to UMass and lives in my single family unit, I, I don't qualify as a student rental because she's, she's the only, as long as we don't rent to someone else we don't rent a room out to someone else. It's not a student rental. It's not a student home because just because she's in school. Um, but if we were to rent to someone, it would count as a student rental if we were to rent that room because we have one person who happens to be a student. I think that's how that definition reads now. Um, even if who we rented to was not a student because our family member. So I don't know whether we've quote, captured in that definition, everything we're wanting to and excluded everything we would want to from that definition. But I attempted to do that. And I did do undergraduate only. Jennifer. Yeah, so I actually, if you're living there, I don't think anyone has any issue with that. Let's put it this way, the problems that are associated with the absentee owned student rentals it's the absentee own that's the issue. So that you're living there does make it a different animal, I think. So maybe instead of including owners, the uh, it be the owner's family members that are occupants if there are unrelated occupants in the dwelling units. Cause that would then, if we don't, it, that would then, if we get rid of the sentence, it might not capture the incidents you just referenced, but- right. Right. If we That's keep this exactly. sentence, but get rid of the owners, so it just right. includes owners' family members. I think it still would. Right, Pam. This, yeah. Oh, you're muted, Pam. I was going to say, let's apply that to the the example that Jennifer just gave. Um, <clears throat> so if given John's statement that <clears throat> if the son's name is on the deed, he then in fact is uh, an owner. And if he rents to one, two, three 
uh, other persons that are students, he qualifies as a student rental, right? Under what's written now, but if his name wasn't on the deed, uh, if we deleted these words and his name was on the deed, it wouldn't be a student rental. Where the owner's family members are occupants. Because if his if his name was on the deed and we deleted the owners, right? Because, but if we kept owners, that would qualify. Um, but what would also qualify is the situation that, that I just described of if I'm living in the house, my daughter's at UMass, she's living in the house and we've got two extra rooms and we want to rent that to someone. Um, under this definition, that would be a student rental. Jennifer. So I, I just have to, it's up to the com, you know, committee, but I would say that, no, that there are the problems that are associated with absentee owned student rentals. I, I wouldn't, it's not an issue if the owner, if you're living there. So I would say, let's be less stringent. We, and we want to encourage owner occupants, not the 18 year old son, I don't know, but, but you renting to students, great. John, thoughts? Yeah, so we have several of these, um, which I which I think is what we're talking about here, where, um, you know, they set up an LLC, they make the 21 year old son an officer of the LLC. So on paper, he owns the house. He's a student at UMass, and he has his buddies who are also students at UMass live in there, and they're paying money. That's the student rental. So you it would be, say keep owner on paper, there, but uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, I agree. If we have, is that if that's what we have to do? Then that's what we have to do. But I would say, you know, certainly the situation where you're living there, right? It's going to be fine. No one's ever going to come to your house and complain. <laughs> okay. Or whatever. But okay, so, thank you. Sounds like we can move on to the yeah. next blue section for now, um, which is the biggest part, the application and permitting section. And I think, um, I, I don't think I can put it all on one page. Um, so um, yeah. we'll start with one A and B. Pam? Hold on, uh, John still has his hand up, but I was wondering if you could scroll that bigger. I, I'm lucky because I have it on another monitor, but this is hard to, to read. Yeah, 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 Okay. Even better, great. So any thoughts or con uh, or comments on what's on the screen? I know there's section C, the address of the residential property. This is just portions of what the application would have to include. Um, but for these two sections, um, owners and then person in charge, the person in charge is where I put the contact, you know, sort of the hour responses to highlight some things a voicemail to the town in one hour, a voicemail to tenants in three hours, and a, an email within 48 hours that's either from the tenant or the town. I know, John, you had said something like you'd love it to be 20 minutes or so, but um, I was concerned when I started reading that. So I'd love to hear from John and Rob about the hour from the town. You know, at two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> time is of the essence. <laughs> I mean, the question is, is something under an hour reasonable to require in a bylaw, I guess, is the thoughts. Michelle, welcome, Michelle and Michelle. <laughs> I'm actually on screen this time. <laughs> um, what is the penalty? So if, I guess, how do we enforce that? And if it's over the 20 minutes or whatever it is that we decide, what actually ends up happening as a result? Who's tracking that? How does that? So, 
so in theory, we haven't gotten to the violation section, but we would probably de deem that a violation of the bylaw, which could then be issued a fine. Okay. We just haven't gotten there yet. Chris. Oh, you're, so you're, this you essentially go. means that someone has to keep their phone by their bedside. And, you know, if the phone rings at two o'clock in the morning, they either look at the phone and turn over for 20 minutes or, or they answer the phone and they respond within an hour. Um, so that's kind of what this means, right? They are responsible for being on call 24 hours a day, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are the town officials comfortable with that? Jennifer? Um, I guess I would ask John, you know, if what condition is the house if there's, if you, you know, there's an emergency at two in the morning where the students can't go back in the house because the house is unsafe. So I would say maybe if somebody's keeping their house in that condition, they, they should be able to be um, pinged at two in the morning and respond. Uh, yeah, fire, um, you know, burst pipe. Um, the, there's, um, it's often a, a small fire. They can't go back in the house and now they need to be rehoused. And you kind of uh, need to, to get to that. Are people comfortable with an hour? Would they like it less, more? Shalini? <laughs> Yeah, what are the norms for this? Like, what would do other towns do? Um, um, so, so what, what I, saw, I saw, I'm hearing it weird to me. What I saw um, was three hours, which is why I moved the voicemail to three hours from a tenant. Um, three hours was what was in the... Um, the, the samples we saw that had this requirement. <laughs> um, so, um, so it's why I went to one, but not for the tenants. Um, Cause I could totally see tenants abusing it too. Pam. Um, I, I think I would be comfortable with leaving it as you have it here with, um, I want them, I mean, if the town is calling them for any reason, it's an important issue, it's not trivial. If, if it is the tenant, and it is in fact in the middle of the night, um, I hope the tenants actually have the number for the owner and or the property manager, and they darn well better do that within three hours. I, I think I'd like to leave it like this or suggest we leave it like this, and then we probably can get some pretty good feedback um, during a public, public conversation on this. Okay. Shalini? Shalini? Just a quick question. When a call comes from the town, does it say it's a town of Amherst or does it just show like a number? Because how would, sometimes I just don't pick up calls and if it's in the middle of the night, if it doesn't say town of Amherst. John? John? It's gonna, it's gonna come, come from, from my... Cell, cell phone. So unless there's a way for the concerned people to know th that this is uh, an important call. Um, Michelle and then Chris. I'm wondering about texting. I know that might seem a little edgy, but I mean, even doctor's offices are texting nowadays. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering, John, from your perspective, do is texting a practice that you have now uh, with landlords or tenants? And is it something that we should consider as at least an alternate means of being in touch, which also gives like a written sort of... Um, record. John? Yep, I'm, I'm doing it. So we could put in voicemail or text at all times. 
something like this. And I did see um, Athena that Steve Roof is in the audience. If you could move him into panelist, that would be great. Um, so we'll leave that for now. We're gonna move on so that we can get through a lot of stuff. We'll obviously see these multiple times. Um, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J is the rest of the stuff that would be required in an application. Um, this is, I, I know I think Steve and Stephanie wanted to talk about I, um, which is where I did my best to balance ECAC's request for a lot of information required in the application and what Rob and John said, maybe we can keep the bylaw a little more um, fluid and flexible. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from Stephanie and, and Steve about whether that might've been accomplished or not. So any thoughts on the rest of what's required in the application and the language is written here? Sounds good, Amanda. Oh, Steve. Yes, hi. Um, thank you for considering that. And I think as far as the bylaw goes, I like what you have there under I. Um, that gives some discretion to change that um, as per the um, principal code official. Um, some of that information we wouldn't need to collect every year. Uh, some of it on the list that I provided you all um, would be useful every year. But I think this gives enough flexibility. So I'm happy with that, okay. that level of language there. Excellent. Thank you for that. I'm gonna scroll down to the application process, renewal and transfer of permits. Um, so this is just the basic language on renewing when they have to be submitted by what you have to do to transfer if there's a new owner um, and the process to apply. Any thoughts, requests for changes or concerns about the language here? Seeing none, we're gonna move on. Hold on, hold on. Oh. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Pam. Get the, hand, the hand up. Um, to, to notify, what's the last one? New owner designated is required to promptly notify the new town of the town of changes in ownership and submit for review and approval any proposed changes in the provision of the permit. Um, does the permit automatically transfer to that new owner? I would like it probably not to. I would like that, that new owner to have to go through a hoop to be essentially made credible in you know name and contact information and all of that does this does that allow for that so this is i'm not sure this is an automatic transfer but it's not an it's not a reapplication this transfer at least the way it's written and the way i interpret it is is not a new application but it's not an automatic transfer um they have to submit it you know, they have to notify the town within 15 days and submit proposed mm -hmm. changes, which would be all the changes to the application, right? All of that information changes within 15 days, um, you know, and so as long as they do that in theory, you know, depending on what other requirements we have for the permit, right? <laughs> if we haven't gotten to the rest of the stuff, there might be other things. Right. Um, that would all need done in 15 days. And it says review and approval, presumably that, that, word would mean that if if those changes do no longer comply with the permit requirement you know the bylaw requirements um the issuance could be denied or non-renewed you know we haven't gotten to those sections right but that that has that language so that it's not automatic yeah good because i don't i don't want it to be automatic <laughs> So we'll move on because I wanted to actually talk about some of these. Um, so fees, the blue is, we don't know what fees we're charging yet or allowing in the bylaw. So we'll fix that as we get through. Um, so I, I 
I want you to ignore what's referenced in fees, but I wanted us to confirm that we wanted the council to be able to determine the fees, or do we want that under the building and commissioner or someone else? I don't know where Rob would like the fees, but um, you know, is, is the council the appropriate location for that? Obviously that's where the bylaw is now. Um, do we want to maintain it there or would Rob and John prefer to have it, or and Chris prefer to have it somewhere else? Rob. Um, certainly fine with it being with the council, but um, you know, it could also be with the Board of License Commissioners uh, or you know, that, that uh, it, I don't think it be, would be staff, but it, you know, or my office, it'd be either the, the council, the board of license commissioners or the town manager. CRC member thoughts on those options? Pat? Uh, yeah, I'd like to see it with the building inspector um, or the board of license uh, commissioners. I mean, it seems appropriate there. Um, I don't think the council needs to weigh in on this. Thank you, Pam. Well, I was thinking about the, the fees that we just talked about for parking and it, it does feel a little bit like, um, the, it does feel like the responsibility of the council to kind of set a, a target for it that, you know, perhaps we could, we could write into it that, um, you know, it could be adjusted, you know, within 10% or something every year. That's, that's really awkward perhaps and, and clunky, but um, I don't remember what, what other fees does Board of Licenses actually collect and manage? Rob can answer that best, I believe. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're responsible for all the alcohol licensing. Um, there's a, a, a list of various license types like um, car dealerships and vending machines and coin operated machines and common vehicular licenses. So there's a, you know, there's a dozen or 15 different application types. Um, and if we had, you know, for we're, we're actually thinking of proposing a fee schedule change that will be taking them. So I, it's not something that they would be unfamiliar with, mm -hmm. you know, if it, you know, if it was decided that it would stay with them. Thank are, you, those, Rob. are things like that um, established at all at a state level where, you know, you, I mean, I have no idea what they charge for a, a uh, you know, car sales license or something like that. It, not at all. It's, it's, it varies widely. Uh, and, you know, like, I think we do, like with every fee that we have, we look at other comparable communities just to get an idea and use that for, you know, justification for making a proposal, but um, there isn't a standard fee and it, it, it can be very different from community to community for all those types of permits. Thank you. Just, just to finish up on, on my thought on that then. Um, so at least through the CRC and with the council, it makes sense to um, establish the different categories of, of rental permits. And we've talked a little bit about how we want fees to be equitable, you know, perhaps based on the number of units and or the number of bedrooms as opposed to uh, one property um, or an owner occupied or owner adjacent kind of property. So. I think maybe when, <clears throat> once we once we establish those categories, yeah, it may be clearer who needs to manage them. Thank you, Jennifer, and then Shalini. Let Shalini go first. She hasn't spoken yet. Shalini. Um, yeah, I, I think I uh, agree with what Pam was proposing that since we are coming up with a certain logic and listening to all the different sides of this issue and creating like a logic for what the fees will look like it makes sense for us to start and then after that um, maybe the board um, of 
licensing, whatever. Um, because I think it also safeguards the staff. Like I remember with the parking, there's a lot of like the staff has to face the anger of or the wrath of the, the residents who have to pay the fees. So it takes away that burden maybe if the staff is not the one implementing it and and uh, coming up with it. But And it's like they can then just say, oh, it's the town council, it's a board of licensee, whatever that term is. Um, so I think it's better for the staff if they don't do it. But I may be wrong. I'm comfortable no, I'm either way though. Thanks. Jennifer? Yeah, I want to ask if the Board of License sets a fee. It doesn't then come to the council, that's that's final. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I in um, one way it would be kind of nice getting it off of us, but I don't, so what I'm just thinking is, and I'm not advocating for one over the other, but when we set change the fee just for this coming fiscal year, I received so many emails from people that were disgruntled about it, you know, um, and it would, I, in a way, you know, like I'd kind of like to say it's up to the board of licensures, but I feel like, I don't know if, well, maybe like Pam and Shalini just said, if we set some parameters, because I feel like they will, if there are questions about it, they will definitely be telling their council representatives about it. So I feel like it's maybe, so I, I don't know, I just want to put that out there. I don't know that I'd feel where I'd like to say, oh, <laughs> go bring your, you know, gripes or whatever to the board of license. I feel like it's maybe that wouldn't be very satisfying to them. That maybe it is our responsibility. It sounds like we'll need a fuller discussion. We might want to send this to TSO also for discussion for their thoughts on who should set the fee. Um, and also I'll mark it for discussion for future public forums and all so that we can hear as a specific discussion item for those those um, those forums and those avenues. Um, Thank you. That would that's a good idea. Yes. Just so we can, you know, it sounds like the language other than the choice is fine. So we can mark that as future discussion. Uh, Dave. Yeah, I, I, I was just going to go back. I, I think I support, it. if I heard Rob right, I, I and I've been listening to the conversation, I really, I favor this sitting with the Board of License Commissioners. I, I think, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of reasons to do that. Um, uh, I think they're, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, but they're, they're very in touch with the business community. They, they, they have a lot of interaction with, with restaurants, with people, you know, doing business. So they're, 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 they're very in touch with what's going on in town. And, and I think uh, going back to something Jennifer said a minute ago about the number of comments you had, I mean, I just don't know if the town council, you know, has the bandwidth to kind of get into this level, you know, of of detail every time again i don't want to be presumptuous there but you got a lot of feedback when when those fees came through so i don't know i, I just think uh they're they're a group that is working very well they're structured very well and they as rob said they 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 deal with a lot of different fees so i don't know i again that's just my two cents i i like that idea thank you dave michelle and then rob Rob, okay. Do you want to go first, Rob? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Just quickly, I was just going to say it's not really a, a, uh, unlike the zoning board or planning board. You know, I think it would function the same way. The staff generally would make a recommendation on a fee, fee schedule change, take it to the border committee, and have them review and adopt it. And and you know, I initially suggested board of license commissioners because I see you know we'll get to it later in the document that if they are truly going to be responsible for rules and regulations. I just thought that, you know, made sense to have it all together. Thank you, Rob. Michelle? I, I do see it both ways. And I'm wondering if it's possible for the board of licensures to be the body that sort of gets into the weeds of reviewing it and determining, but could it then come to the council? Or is that is that out of 
practice to do that? Could it come to the council for sort of a final approval? So, so in theory, yes, there's a couple of bylaws that the bylaw sets the permit fee or the license fee. Um, so right now, in theory, to change it, the council would have to change it through a bylaw change. Um, I, in my contacts with the Board of License Commissioners, I've received requests to remove that from the bylaws and just put in the bylaws the authority for the board to set those fees. Because when they're in, when the fee itself, like not the fact of a fee, but the actual amount is in a bylaw, it never gets changed uh, because you have to go through a bylaw change. But that's, that's, that's how those work right now is unless the council is going to bring it up, that request for that change would come from the board who's handing out those licenses and say, hey, we really need to change this. And then it would come to the council, but it would be through a bylaw change. I'm not sure it's the most efficient or the most logical, mm -hmm. which is why I think the BLC has requested in various times for us to change that through me. And I've got some drafts out there and working on timelines for that. Um, that I have to touch base with them on. But yeah, so it's always possible, but is it logical and efficient? Pam, and then we're gonna move on to the next sections. Yeah, I would, I, so as, as this all gets handed off, obviously we'll have public hearings. Um, I would like, I would like CRC and with the assistance of the town staff here to uh, help us target a, at least a base fee structure so that we can give Board of Licensure a target and get them rolling. I would, I would like to, I'd like to have a say in that because I think this is, this is a, a pretty big step and it really does need to get supported by the, by the council in order to, you know, just, just to kick it off and get it going. Yep. Sounds good. Um, we're going to move on to the next ones, which are just, I think, just I and J, which is the regulations and then the disclosure notification. Um, we didn't actually talk about disclosure notification. We've mentioned it, so I thought I'd put something in here. But the regulations, as, as Rob um, alluded to, um, this is sort of a catch-all if there's needed regulations. Um, I have uh, this draft says that the principal code official would develop them. And once they're developed, they can be amended with the approval of the Board of License Commissioners. It's not the greatest wording because it doesn't say who adopts them initially. It's almost like Rob can adopt them initially, but if he ever wants to change them, the board has to allow him to change it. Um, so it might need some working, uh, but I thought I'd, that's the proposal that is in here is that they're, they either sit with the board fully you know, or partially, or they sit with Rob. I didn't know where Rob stood on the, the thoughts on this. And then the disclosure notification is the attempt to, um, similar to like the right to farm notifications to have any property sale in town uh, the purchaser of any, re uh, we could probably do this with residential property, whether or not they are permitted right now as rentals or not, receive this notification that says, hey, if you're planning on renting it, know that we have this bylaw. Um, so that's the attempt to do in J of what to do. So thoughts on regulations and disclosure notifications. I'm sure Rob has some, but others, anyone? Jennifer? No, just, I like it. I think that's, that's very efficient. Let everyone know whether it applies to them or not. Pam? I was unmuted. Um, yeah, could, could Rob or John or whoever um, give a couple examples of regulations? So when we have a, a bylaw like this, um, break it down for me as far as what some examples of regulations might be. Rob or John? Rob? So, um, you know, the regulations could, they're, depending on what's in the bylaw and what's not in the bylaw could include a lot of different things. Uh, you know, the operation of the board of license commissioners and their roles through any appeal process uh, could be an example. Uh, we could get into very specific um, 
inspection pro, uh, procedures, you know, what, what types of buildings receive, what types of inspections uh, and, and what durations. Uh, so there could be um, what are the kind of the protocols for follow-up or repeat inspections or regular routine um, monitoring at properties. Um, so I, you know, and there's probably a lot of other things that we could think of, but I, I think it all depend on what actually lands inside the, in the bylaw and, and what's missing uh, to kind of fill in the gaps for the day-to-day -day work. Um, so my, my comment about the regulations though, would be that um, I think it would be fine if it just said that the rules, the regulations may be adopted and amended by the board of license commissioners. I don't, I don't think it needs to um, mm. say developed by the principal code official. And, and again, it's only because I think the, in the, our, our normal practice, that's how it would work. We, you know, staff would absolutely be involved in working on this and making recommendations uh, to the board or committee that we're supporting. And I think it, it works nicely to have that done at the board level, you know, uh, whether they're taking it on their own, which the board of license commissioners uh, has done already. You know, I, I think Mandy knows they, you know, they were working on amendments to the, to the current regulation on their own. Uh, some of that, you know, I brought forward, but some of it I didn't. So I think it's good to have that option and, you know, we'll always, uh, you know, have a good line of communication with the license commissioners to bring them our ideas and, and try to gain their support for things we'd like to see uh, amended in the bylaw or in the regulations. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> right. There we go. Just limit it to regulations. No, yeah. I was like, oh, we don't want to listen because we don't know, but regulations are in this bylaw. So so that that would be the new wording. And and I wanted to say one more thing when Pam had the question, and then we're going to move on to that that conversation regarding inspections and everything, is the other thing that I can truly foresee regulations, which while the board might have to adopt the ECAC might want to be truly involved in, is stuff related to if we're going to potentially require the that the rental meets certain home efficiency standards under whatever program. I know there were a lot of documents in the in the packet today about potential programs, the regulations about which program gets used, what score they need and all of that. That would be part of the regulations in my visioning instead of in the bylaw itself where the bylaw itself might just say they have to have passed X efficiency standard under the regulations adopted pursuant to this bylaw or something like that so that those can be changed more easily than a bylaw. Michelle, and then we're going to go on to that inspections and other requirements discussion. I'm touching on the disclosure disclosure notification. Is that yep. are we still there? Okay. Yep. Um, the current language feels like there's a likely risk that this would not, uh, that this disclosure happening through the property owner might not happen. <laughs> um, and I'm just wondering what we can do to include real estate agents or realty, you know, companies into this, at least through some sort of education or letting them, making them aware that we require this, or there's a fine um, for violations, because I can see how this could potentially get missed. This is going to be a pretty, um, a pretty hefty bylaw, I think, in the end, and there's going to be a lot to it. So I do have concerns about that. Okay. John? Yeah, I um, am uh, also interested in how this gets disseminated. Um, you know, when I first started doing this work, I made it a point to go to each of the real estate companies and put on a little presentation. And maybe that's a way that this happens again. Um, they have um, monthly meetings with all of their realtors and then, you know, the information gets out that way. But I wanted to thank you for putting this in here. It's absolutely critical. I'm finding so many properties changing hands now and, you know, the new owners really don't have a clue. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on from this. This is obviously not the last discussion of this one. Um, and we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda, 
um, which is discussion of inspections and other requirements to obtain a license. And there are, you know, in the current bylaw, there's sort of two requirements from what I can see. There's sort of the self-inspection and then there's stuff relating to parking. Um, Stephanie and Steve are here because I believe they want us to add some sort of energy efficiency inspection or requirement into those requirements to obtain a license. Um, and so we can, I, I think I wanna start with what Steve and Stephanie and ECIC would like because they're here now. Um, and therefore we might, they might not have to attend the next meeting if we get their discussion over with um, to save them some time before we truly get into, cause that, you know, that involves sort of everyone here um, and cause it's a subset of other inspections, but John, you still have your hand up. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. Um, but we can also talk about inspections in general because they kind of overlap. And so, you know, and all, and then any other requirements we'd like to see to obtain a license. And like I said, this will be um, not the only discussion regarding this. I expect this to happen in two weeks too, to continue this discussion in two weeks. So um, I'm just gonna start with Steve or Stephanie, cause Steve, you provided, I wanna say thank you to ECIC, the information provided by ECIC, I found extremely helpful. Um, I hope the rest of the committee members did too, um, to help us understand where you're getting this push, who's done it before. I now know I can go to Boulder and look for some language, which is very helpful <laughs> um, and I will be doing, um, but, but gave us some background as to how it could actually be incorporated into a permitting bylaw. Cause I know that's one thing I was struggling with is to how that works. So do you wanna talk a little bit about what, what you think, um, we, what ECAC would like in terms of to see in terms of a requirement to obtain a permit to rent? Sure, I can address that. And if, if Stephanie has more, um, I hope she can jump in as well. We have been working on this for a little over a year, researching different opportunities. And we've had some assistance from the Rocky Mountain Institute, or now they refer to themselves as RMI. They've provided us with a coach who's helped us with some research. And they've also offered to do some research on um, the Amherst housing stock. And uh, we have some data, but not as much as we would like in terms of the, the styles of how rental housing in Amherst. But in general, what we want to do is to, because we know we need to improve the energy efficiency of all buildings in town and rental properties in particular have the problem of the split incentive where the owners don't have the incentive to increase energy efficiency when the tenants pay the utility bills. So we would like to find ways to incentivize those owners to do that, to get some energy assessments and they, there's a variety of those. And some of those could be the free mass save inspections that provide um, some indication of energy efficiency and then also provide the incentives. And then there are more in-depth uh, inspections that can be used. We've done some research on the different types of inspections that can be used. Some of them are checklists. Most of them evaluate the building and not the actual energy use. So it doesn't, it's not influenced by the tenant's behavior, uh, nor does it um, uh, infringe on privacy. Some, some folks consider their energy use sort of a, um, something they don't want made public. So most of these look at the building, uh, the, the, the amount of insulation in the walls, the ceilings, the types of windows, the type of construction, and then the efficiency of the heating units and any air conditioning units in them. So those are often a checklist that go through. Some of these are provided by the Department of Energy, energy.gov, they're free to use but you would have to have some sort of qualified inspectors that are able to go through and do these. Um, that's one way of raising awareness uh, and then providing some incentives, either incentives, pure incentives, the carrot approach, or perhaps um, uh, some other requirements that as a condition of, of having the privilege of renting, there has to be a level of minimum energy standard. Um, and then raising awareness of some of the specific programs that are available for building owners to improve their energy efficiency and the, the mass save program for some, there's also the PACE program that the town has adopted that are, uh, would work for some of the larger buildings. So we have not gotten to the point where we could recommend a specific 
energy efficiency rating system. Um, and that's going to take some more discussion, I think, with town inspectors and others to, to kind of we uh, go through those and decide which might be best. Um, but I'm glad we've had this chance to, to raise the idea, the concept of what we're trying to do and get feedback from everybody here as to how we might achieve that to help improve the energy efficiency and the comfort and life um, living conditions for renters and reduce the energy burdens. Uh, that, that's a key thing I meant to mention. We want building owners to increase the energy efficiency, but we don't want them to raise the rents um, and, and cause problems to the tenant. So we've got to find the right balance there. Some, some communities that have adopted these have limited the amount that building owners would have to uh, upgrade or the amount they would spend to upgrade. So let me, let me pause there and see if, if anybody has questions or if Stephanie um, wants to chime in with more. Stephanie, do you have anything to add before questions? Stephanie, you got your hand up. And you're still muted. Sorry. There you go. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so I, I, there's not a whole lot I can really add to what Steve said. I think he covered it pretty comprehensively. But I mean, I think it's an opportunity for the ECAC to, to sort of help um, look into that and to create some kind of a recommended model for the town. I mean, I think that would be a good use of, of them as a body and as an, a knowledgeable body. Um, I think, you know, there are other communities as well as Boulder, Colorado. There's also Burlington, Vermont that you could look at, look to as well to see how they've done this. Um, but I know that there's also an effort in the state and I'm part of another um, effort that's looking at creating some kind of building disclosure bylaw that's separate from the one that I've been involved in with RMI um, that also includes Massachusetts communities. So, you know, I think that the state is even moving in this direction. So by the time we sort of get this all pulled together, there might even be some guidance from the state level. So I would just say, you know, ECAC can serve as a body to help create a model for you. Um, and they could sort of do some of that legwork. I guess that's just the recommendation I would make because it's so broad and open as to how we could go. Thank you, Stephanie. I, I'm gonna start before Pam. Um, one of my questions is, I, I was quite impressed by the, as I already said, by the information sent. It sounds fantastic. It gave me an idea of how to put this into a bylaw. And one of the ways I was thinking could be incorporated into a bylaw was through sort of saying um, th they have to pass whatever energy efficiency, but don't create, you know, I, I'm not sure what the wording would be, but say, you know, just like we might say, you have to pass an inspection by the building, you know, by the principal code of enforcer or officer or whatever, we might say, you also have to prove the adequate level of energy efficiency. Those regulations could be passed by the board of license commissioners, but ECA under the regulation thing we just saw, but ECAC would basically create those or work with the board to have them, the board would then adopt them. That would then be more modifiable and more quickly so that they're not necessarily, I always feel like regulations are more flexible um, and easier to change than a bylaw and it would provide that flexibility if we went that way. Um, and so my question in thinking about as we get to language would be how to provide the right level of flexibility but also guidance within the bylaw itself. So things like should we in a bylaw require that be passed every year or every two years or every three years? This is gonna be the same with inspections type thing. Um, and so some guidance about what would be, what should be in the bylaw as, as that language starts getting drafted would really help me, um, as well as if the rest of this committee thinks this is a fantastic idea, I would almost say start thinking about what those regulations might look like, um, you know, so that they might be close to ready to go by the time the bylaw is ready to be passed. Um, that would sort of be my thinking. But uh, I'm going to go to Pam and then Stephanie. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to ask sort of a general question. It's I, I hope to bring it up a number of times, and that is that with uh, the staff doing the permitting, let's 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 say there are town staff involved in all of this. Um, I really would like to meet with the IT folks or whoever, the GIS folks, whoever is helping track the data because I think um, to not get in the weeds too much, having some kind of a searchable database is, is really the only 
reason that we could ask for this level of detail and um, you know and expect to do something with it. Nobody is going to leaf through printed you know applications to see what kind of uh, insulation is in the 1960s split level. Um, it, it, it has to be, you know, as easily accessible as the number of units in the building, that kind of thing. So that's just a something to keep in mind. Thank you, Stephanie. I know you unraised your hand, but I did. But um, I, I did. But then um, that response made me think that, you know, I think our idea is that could there could be some kind of rating system that initially looks at those features. And as Steve said, you don't necessarily have them be something that has to be reviewed every year. And so there could be a rating system that takes that into account initially, but doesn't necessarily mean it's annual review. I'm going to, I'm going to come back because I, I like that. I, yep. uh, if there's a way to establish, you know, it, you just said something about RMI helping review the, let's just call it the characteristics of rental units in Amherst. And we know that, you know, whatever, 20% of these buildings are 1960 split level houses. We know the basic construction types in that era. And I think you know, maybe there's a way to just say, here's my house, it was built in, you know, this year. And we understand sort of automatically what the characteristics are. If people have made energy improvements, I'd like to have that as an incentive. So that I don't know, I don't know. Maybe their fee goes down or something. But but we sort of work from a basis of of the basic characteristics of any architectural style. Just an idea. Thank you. Seeing no other hands directly related to this, I'd love to go to Rob and John about what types of inspections requirements or um, other types of requirements they'd like to see for a building to obtain a rental permit. I'll just start it off with, um, you know, I think it's really important that we do a conduct an initial inspection of every property. Um, you know, from that point on, I, I think I'm open to uh, how often a building would get reinspected in some cases, maybe ever again, you know, unless there's an issue, but uh, I think we have the opportunity to go through, get baseline information about the property that's accurate that we don't have now, and then um, consider some sort of a, um, you know, whether it's a rating or what it might be about its condition to decide whether or not it goes into some, uh, some ongoing regular routine uh, reoccurring inspection schedule. Um, I think that's a, a minimum requirement and that's, you know, something that we, we are sort of, you know, missing now and uh, struggle with uh, quite often, but I'll let uh, John add more. If... John? Yeah, I agree that we, it, it would be beneficial uh, to get eyes in every unit um, at least once. Um, and that'll, that'll um, help develop a database of the, other properties that need, um, you know, more vigilance. Um, a lot of these properties, we're going to go in and look at them. They're going to be just fine, and you probably never need to go in again. I know Pam's going to have some thoughts and questions on this, but one of my thoughts are one of my questions is: Are there specific when we're writing a bylaw? Are there specific things you'd like to us to include in the bylaw in terms of how a inspect you know how a property might pass inspection or not pass inspection you know in terms of i think we've got some drafts that are like if they don't fit 60 percent or 30 percent violations or you know things like that then they need reinspected and stuff like that um do you want do you want certain types of criteria like that in the bylaw and if so like would we be citing and referencing the state sanitary code, the state building code, or would we be picking specific parts of that and specific items to be looking at? So I actually think that might be better off in the regulations uh, because uh, it, it'll be really unpredictable what, what 
will come of that. Uh, and we could have the ability to modify that pretty easily if we need to. Um, you know, it, it could be a situation where we just aren't able to fulfill whatever requirement that the bylaw calls for. Uh, or maybe there's a need to go a little bit further because, um, you know, because we don't have issues that, you know, as many issues. Uh, so I, I think that's something we're interested in establishing uh, in writing, uh, but maybe not in the bylaw. Other so, committee, Pam? So just to follow up on that, does that, does that sort of say what Mandy Jo just said, that if, if we reference that they must meet, you know, mass building code or, or unified building code, whatever it is these days, um, that's the kind of thing that would be helpful because you have standards that have been laid out. We don't have to list them each and every one, right? That's right. I mean, there, there isn't a choice. They have to meet those standards. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what those standards are what will be used when conducting inspections. Um, the severity, the number of those, you know, violations of those types of um, provisions will be, that'll be the piece that we try to develop, you know, decide what, what happens to a property that has so many violations or so many types of violations and where and how often that might be uh, continued to be inspected. Um, on the kind of the other end of all of this, in the inspections piece, uh, I think it's really important that we have the ability to, uh, upon complaint, upon uh, found violations, repeat violations, the ability to clearly uh, mandate a periodic inspection, uh, reoccurring inspection for, for those uh, properties that are not performing well. Um, that was, you know, one of the changes that I was working on with the Board of License Commissioners for the current bylaw. Uh, it's, a, it's a small number of properties, uh, but it's a small number of properties because we're only doing complaint response right now. So I would, I would expect that to go up when we actually look at properties that we've never been in and, and get a closer uh, understanding of their conditions. But um, it is a small number of properties and it's something that we uh, really feel we need to have is that ability to um, hopefully change the property, you know, work with the owner and, and uh, instead of just dealing with one issue and then, you know, next year or the year after we're back there again for the same issue or oftentimes John will tell you, you know, one semester to another, um, you know, having a, an inspection program that could be instituted for customized for that property uh, will probably be our best chance of ever getting change at that location. Thank you, John. Yeah, that's, that's right. And, and Rob's seen this. Uh, we've seen this work with um, problem properties. We've already put them on a schedule where we inspect them, you know, three or four times a year, we charge the landlord 150 bucks a pop to go and do it. And, um, you know, after a year of doing that, the property's in better shape um, because they know we're coming again. So I have, I have a question. This one goes to not just these inspections, but also any potential energy efficiency ECAC type inspections that ECAC might want to see, because I see them as sort of two different types of inspections. Um, I, I'm getting from multiple conversations with Rob and John that you would like the building type inspections to be done by town staff, not for the property owners to be able to bring in, you know, a home inspector like purchasers do when they're buying a piece of property that you want it done by town staff. I just want to confirm whether that's the case so that that can go in the bylaw. And then I want to ask Steve and Stephanie, do you see the, the energy efficiency type inspections also be done? being done by town staff um, or would they be, um, or do you see them potentially being done by someone hiring these certified inspectors, paying for that inspection, you know, the property owner paying for that and then submitting the report as part of the application process. So John, and then I'm gonna go to Steve. Yeah, the, the building code type 
um, inspections and, and um, you know, Massachusetts Sanitary Code housing inspections, those need to be done by an inspector who's certified to do that. And that's, that's what we have in town staff now. Uh, somebody who does inspections for a prospective home buyer, you know, they don't have the same qualifications and they can't, they can't cite those violations the way we can. Thank you. And Steve? We've looked at a couple of systems that are sponsored, uh, two of them by the Department of Energy. It's the one is a home energy score or HES. Um, that is about a one hour inspection, I'm told. And um, that looks at the home's envelope. And normally there are people who are qualified to do that. I, um, private, private companies will do that for a fee. I don't know what the qualifications are um, the Department of Energy, and that's also that particular one is only good for single family homes. But DOE has a newer building energy assessment score, uh, which is for commercial and multifamily residential buildings. That one looks more straightforward. There's a one page form, a checklist that can be used to inspect a building and has boxes to check depending on the style of, of roof and walls and appliances. So conceivably that could be done by town staff, but our thinking was more likely that it would be a requirement that the building owner get hire somebody to do an inspection and produce a report that would then be submitted. Um, that said, the city of Boulder, Colorado has that as one option then, but they also do, I believe most of the building owners choose to go through the checklist, the, the city's own checklist and that is administered by city staff uh, in Boulder. A third way of approaching it, or yet another way of approaching it might be in, rather than the building asset, we could consider asking the building owners for actual energy use, which they would have to request from the utility. And in some cases, larger buildings can do that using the EPA portfolio manager um, and the utilities can automatically link to an account and provide that data, at least the electric utilities. Um, Berkshire Gas doesn't do that yet, um, but that's another way. And that's more often used for commercial sort of office buildings and bigger buildings. So that's what say Boston uses for the energy disclosure rules for big buildings. Um, so yeah, all three of those possibilities. Um, owner hires somebody to do an inspection. The town has staff that can do the, those inspections or the owners submit energy use data, aggregate energy use data um, using uh, the, from the utilities. So those are all options we'd have to discuss further about which might fit best here in Amherst. Thank you. Um, Stephanie. Yeah, I just wanted to concur with Steve about having more discussion about which option fits best because I, I don't think we can say um, concretely right now and make a recommendation right now as to which would be the best fit. But I, I do think um, I do think some responsibility on the landlord. I, I don't know something that's going to require town staff to have to go through a bunch of you know utility data. I think that's going to be cumbersome. Um, but I do think some requirement that the landlord take a large portion of the responsibility um, and then some kind of a certified professional be involved. Okay. That helps in thinking about how this might look drafted. Um, any other thoughts on particularly on inspections, inspections or, ECAC or ECAC type inspections, type inspections, inspections before, before we move, we on, move to on to other requirements? requirements. Shalini. Shalini. Yeah, I don't know how this fits into the inspection, but when we're talking about collection of data from uh, building owners regarding energy use, I think part of the goal of ECAC in our town was to create awareness. Uh, and so is there like while we're talk, thinking about what information we're collecting from them, can the ECAC also think about what information we're providing to them as like, here's why you should be doing this or, you know, what is the educational aspect for the tenants and the landlord? Thank you. I know our current bylaw has additional requirements to obtain a permit, including meeting some sort of parking regulations and all that may or may not be part of the zoning bylaw. I haven't cross-referenced it myself. Um, are there any other 
items besides a complete application, an inspection, and an energy efficiency requirement of some sort um, that committee members or anyone on this, you know, staff, you know, Steve and all would like to see as part of obtaining a permit. Steve and then Pam. One other idea that's not related to energy efficiency of the building itself uh, that ECAC has come up with, and that is consider some kind of requirement for on-site electric car charging facilities at apartments, at rental housing. As you know, that can be a major showstopper for tenants if they don't have the ability to charge their car at their residence. That could be a big, a big problem for them. So that, that could be something to include some requirement for a number of car charging stations uh, at a rental property. That could be part of the parking plan, perhaps. Thank you, Steve. Pam. Uh, so I wanted to just sort of generally ask town staff about um, checklists. So we've got, you know, potential checklists for energy efficiency. We've got some checklists for what your health and safety review looks like. Um, is that the kind of thing that we include in the, but we should, should think about including in the bylaw so that we are really clear these are the kinds of things that those owners every owner will have to meet? Or is that the kind of thing that um, is best left to regulation? Um, Rob? Uh, my, I would suggest it's best left to regulations. There are things that often change, um, new technology or whatever the case may be. There's, there's always um, adjusting to those checklists uh, so I think um, just for efficiency, we would suggest they be in the regulations. Okay. Stephanie and then Shalini. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that I suggest that they be referenced in the bylaw, but not specifically outlined just so that they can be adjusted. Um, as Rob just said, based on technology, they'd be better referenced and then, in the, and then put into the regulations. Okay. Shalini. Yeah, just like the on-site electricity, uh, electric cars charging, I think um, we could add maybe other items like solar-ready roofs. And I don't know, maybe the ECAC can come up with a whole list, their wish list of what an ideal building <laughs> looks like. And that could be part of the checklist and, and maybe then giving them points or like whatever our point system is going to be and how we assess buildings. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Jennifer. Jennifer. Um, again, just to put it out there for probably another future discussion, but so I know we'll probably get some pushback, particularly from people that are just renting a single family house, you know, saying you're like having the, ch the battery charging station, which I think is a great idea, but there may be a response of, well, why are we being held to a different standard than other homeowners? So again, we might just want to make the decisions kind of a policy decision that, you know, by um, if you have the privilege of renting an Amherst, you, you know, have to meet certain energy efficiency standards. But I'm, I'm just saying I can imagine when we ask for public comment that we may get these kinds of comments. And, and I'm not, I'm just putting it out there. Thank not you for that. Um, Pam. Yeah, thanks. Um, Again, uh, I was responding to something that Shalini just said about uh, as we track to see what uh, energy efficiencies are being provided today or you know, as people buy properties. Uh, again, it feels like that's the kind of thing that we want to inform, educate, and then add as incentives because I don't have a roof that can accept solar, so I will never have solar on my roof. Um, I, I don't we certainly we certainly can't penalize people because they don't have you know walls with r40 or whatever or roof with r40 we want to leave them that way but we don't we can't demand it thank you for that stephanie uh, a couple of things as far as the charging i think um i don't anticipate that you know a single family home or uh, 
you know, would be required to have um, a charging station, but it may be that um, units that have, you know, like a building with four or more units might potentially be required to have charging. So, you know, I don't think it would be an across the board kind of requirement. Um, and also I would say that, you know, the future of the automobile industry is moving towards electric. And so I think we're going to have to have more of this infrastructure and it's a lot of pressure for the town to have to provide all of the EV infrastructure. So I think some of that responsibility will have to be on um, apartment dwelling units that are, you know, multiple. Um, that's one thing. And then the other thing, I think I, to respond to what Pam just said, um, is that I, I, you know, I think we want to make sure that we have some requirement um, for efficiency, for building efficiency that is, um, you know, certainly reasonable, but um, I'm sorry, Pam, I just lost my point of, I just lost track of the point that you made. Um, what was the last thing you just said? I'm sorry. Um, that we, that we provide incentive perhaps, perhaps for adding rather than, than um, penalizing them to begin with, we, we incentivize them to do the right thing. Right, exactly. So I think the point was we were looking to, you know, some kind of a rating system. You were saying that some buildings can't, um, you know, the walls are a certain R value and they're not going to change. I think the point we were making before was that, um, you know, with a rating system, the incentive would be the rating system itself, right? So um, it, it may be that the incentive for a property owner who has, you know, on a scale of one to 10, a property owner that has a building that's a three when a more efficient building is a nine, um, may be incentivized to to um, increase the efficiency somehow, because there are there are opportunities to do more. And there's usually programming, especially now through Mass Save and others, where there can be some additional help to support them doing uh, that kind of improvement. Okay. Can I, can I follow up on that? Sure. That'd be great because if you have if you have um, all of your buildings rated, and and a person could actually pick their their house that they want to rent based on feel good because I you know I'm renting a house that's a, a a nine point as opposed to a two point, so that may be a way to do it. So I have one question and then we're going to move on to the next items on our agenda because we've got plenty of time at other meetings to talk about this, which is, um, and and it, you might not be able to answer it now, Rob, but I know that, you know, the current bylaw has parking requirements in there and meeting that. And are they different than the zoning requirements for each of these buildings um, in order to get their single family home or their duplex you know, special permit or site plan review or building permit for a single family home? And if so, uh, why? Um, and I guess, wouldn't the, any parking requirements be better off in the zoning bylaw themselves with just a reference to meeting all requirements, you know, in the building in, in this rental permitting is just meeting all requirements of whatever building, you know, of our zoning bylaws, like, maybe someone knows the history as to why the parking went in there and if they're any different than our zoning bylaws. So the, the parking regulations piece of the rental bylaw is that the, um, the plan be provided. So that, that's really it about the, you know, providing a parking, may, a parking plan, otherwise it's compliance with the parking regulations of the zoning bylaw. Uh, the only, part that's really different for properties is if they're then further regulated through special permit uh, conditions that might have very specific parking requirements that are different from the bylaw, like the num total number of cars or where they can be parked or uh, the number of compact spaces, or um, we've been for the last several years requiring uh, parking management systems, you know, uh, stickering and or placarding of cars that are on the larger unit developments. Um, so, that, but there aren't really any new, there aren't any new regulations created by the bylaw um, other than what's in the zoning bylaw itself. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, John. Yeah, the only, the only reason it's, it, it could be different 
Mandy, is is um, you know these single family homes often have four cars parked. They they need to provide parking for those four cars, and um, and you know most most single family homes in town don't have that kind of parking. They they never anticipated that. There's probably only two cars associated with the place. Thank you for that clarification. That'll help me as I draft. We're gonna move on and we're gonna change slightly the order I was planning on doing things because there is a member of the audience in the audience who's had their hand raised. So for that reason, I'm actually going to go to public comment right now um, before I, I anticipate people leaving soon <laughs> as town staff. So I'm gonna start with public comment and members of the audience may comment on matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC up to three minutes. Um, and so I think we've only got one member and they've got their hand raised. So I'm going to recognize Renata Shepard. Please unmute yourself um, and make your comment. Hi. Um, thank you for uh, allowing me to comment. I actually, I wasn't sure if I would, if I would be able to comment. So I, I did write an email responding to uh, Pam's email. So it should be there. It's regarding the amount of oversight. Um, if you own a condo and you're renting it out, you're bound by the association. Um, so any improvements, possibility of uh, energy efficiency, all that is bound by a condo association, the trustees, and the, uh, the ability to, for the condo association to actually afford to do that. That's why people pay a condo fee because that's supposed to be managed by the board. The other thing, um, car charging station. I mean, people can go to a public place for that. And I, I like the comments that I've heard regarding, um, yeah, you rate the property and you rent a place that you can afford. If they don't have a charging station, I mean, that's your choice. It, it, there, there shouldn't be so much control in terms of what can or cannot go into a property. It, it shouldn't be at a higher standard than a house that you own. Um, I, I just think there should be a fair play here because otherwise only big companies will be able to afford to um, be a landlord. Um, a small landlord will have no ability to compete. And then you're going to have only big companies rent, uh, regulating your, or, or controlling your rental properties in the city. And usually they are harder to deal with. I mean, they have the money and they have the resources. So I guess that's what I wanted to say. Think of the small landlords and what they can afford to do. And you know, people do have choices when they want to rent a place. Thank you. thank you. Thank you for those comments, Renata. And um, thank you for attending the meeting and listening to the discussion. We welcome any emails you have and any thoughts on you have uh, that you have about this as we move through it. Um, and so with that, there are no other hands raised in the attendees. Um, so we're going to close public comment. We're going to go on to discussion item rental, residential rental bylaw outreach. So I wanna start with two things. Um, the first one I'm gonna start with is a date for a public dialogue forum or meeting. And then we're gonna to move to um, the chart Excel spreadsheet that Shalini had. I, I think some people may choose to leave. So I wanna thank Stephanie, John, Rob, Dave, Chris, uh, some of them are already gone, I think. Steve, um, for coming, you can, you're always welcome to stay for this, but this is talking about public outreach more than the actual bylaw itself and what would be included in it. Um, so if, if you'd like to stay, you can stay. Um, if you don't want to, or you have other things to do and think you're not needed, feel free to leave. Uh, but thank you all for joining us for the conversations for the first part of the meeting too. Um, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is a date for that big public thing. Um, and then we're gonna go into Shalini's thing. And so I looked at our work plan and we had been talking about doing it sooner rather than later, but not so soon that we don't have time to plan. So in July, um, the Mondays that are available are July 11th and July 25th. 
the 11th is about four weeks away. One, two, three, yep, about four weeks away. And the 25th is obviously six weeks away, two weeks after that. And so I would like us, even if we're not ready with knowing how we would advertise it and what we're gonna ask and all of that, I would like us to pick a date so that we can actually start putting it on town council things so that district um, counselors and anyone with a newsletter can start putting it out on their newsletters that this is when it's going to happen, that I can tell Lynn, here's what we're doing and this is the date type thing. Um, so, so thoughts on July 11th or 25th, um, I was thinking 7 p.m. Um, I expect it to go given the level of interest a while um, and all. Um, we don't have to decide format necessarily right now, but I would like us to try and find a date. Uh, Jennifer. So this will not be at um, on a Thursday CRC. It'll be at a Monday council. So not at a council meeting. These are the nights that there aren't council meetings, if I looked correctly. Um, but I was thinking that Monday nights um, CRC members would have available, whereas Thursday nights, and we would want it in the evening, not in late afternoon, to get as many people here as possible to be participating. And so that a Monday night might be easier to schedule for CRC members and also for um, the public and other counselors. Since we meet on Monday nights, the ones we don't have council meetings are generally free. Um, but but we, those dates can be, we can find other dates potentially. I would personally be on that, on summer vacation on the 25th, but could make the 11th or whatever that's worth. That's just my personal. Pam. I was, I was gonna just, and I thank Jennifer for that comment. I was looking at the calendar thinking, seems like more time is better than less time. But I then thought, well, I better check to see if, if I'm on vacation then too. Um, I, I could do either, yeah. And um, it's just that I will only have a short period of time, you know, about a week when I get back to dive into helping get this ready. So that was the only reason for me reaching a later target. I can live with it. Uh, Shalini. Yeah, I think more time is better than less time. And I will be away on the 11th, but I could try to connect from wherever I am. So, but my preference is 25th. Pat. I'm available on either date. Jennifer. Um, yeah, I, I, in spite of my own schedule, I think it probably is better later. If I'm not on a plane, I will try and, um, that's like when I'm coming home, but I will, uh, I'll, I'll check. Hopefully I can zoom in. We could also look into the August dates because I think I don't know what our, I, I have to look at my calendar. Um, there's August 1st, um, you know, which would be one week after the 25th. Is there a um, town council meeting that night? Well, yeah. I, that's what I'm looking, hold oh, on. I think there is. Oh, yep, there is on the 1st, um, but not the 8th. So the 8th would also, August 8th would also potentially be a date. So could we chat just for a second about what we want to try to, I mean, I know we haven't talked at all about what we would do for outreach. Um, I think in the past, it has been helpful for folks in the community to, you know, realize that things really are in draft rather than being seeming very cut and dried and already being processed. Um, so it, I guess the question is what to, what do folks feel we want to um, put basic topics up? You know, how do you feel about this, this, and this? What's your reaction to this, this, and that? Um, opposed to, as opposed to putting out, you know, draft text and say, well, what do you think about this line? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer, um, and Pat and Shalini can, can chime in or ask whatever they were raising their hands for. Um, we would obviously discuss this in more depth because we're not intending to decide this today. I'm just trying to get a date settled on this part. But my vision is 
coming to that forum with you know some potential specific questions to ask you know um on part particular topics we will probably disclose the working draft wherever it is in whatever form it is um as a you know if you're interested in text this is where we've gotten to right now and our thoughts now and one of the sections of the night might be if you're interested in that text and want to comment on that text now's the time you know ver but that would probably be after in my thinking any of the comments on a specific inspection you know sort of what we've been doing general inspections general fees general you know comment on those things you know sort of but we as a committee would come up with what topics we want to hear the most from and and you know sort of do it that's that's sort of what i've thought the committee would have to decide so i don't foresee it as a sort of a free for all i see it as a structured public comment ish period with a dialogue where we would answer questions um you know where the staff may be here to answer questions themselves um you know, we wouldn't, we would aim to talk as members as little as possible because we'd want their feedback, but when questions arise, we would try to answer them. Pat and then Shalini. Thank you. Uh, the, I'm looking at this and I'm realizing that uh, renters who are not students will be here uh, in July and August, but we're looking at regulating student housing um, with good reason, but I feel like the, the students and the renters who are students uh, also need a voice and we're not providing any if we do it in July and August. So I'm concerned about that and I, I would like to either have a, a, a second public forum or, um, or move this to as far away as early September. Thank you for that comment, Shalini, and then Jennifer. Jennifer. Yeah, thanks, Pat. That, I think that's an excellent point. Um, hadn't thought of that, but yeah, that makes sense. And um, I would be okay with pushing it forward or having two um, public forums because every time it's a touch point for people to get information where we're in the process and then, get, you know, so that's fine. And uh, also, I would. I was thinking what the purpose would be is, um, you know, as we discuss today's outreach uh, ideas, that there are specific questions. And I think Mandy Jo already alluded to that. And also Pat, um, Pam, you said that there would be certain topics. So we, we could, uh, we would, because what we're interested in is understanding people's lived experiences with respect to the quality of their life, safety in their neighborhoods, and so forth. So some of the forum could be used, and these are, this is what we are interested in hearing about. And then the other aspect is, of course, them talking just about whatever they want to talk about. But we could, and then we are thinking of having maybe a survey, if you decide that today, to have like a Google survey, which... Uh, can go out to students and through specific channels to try and reach as many different communities as possible. So uh, people will hopefully already have answered some, some may have answered. So we have some data and some feeling of where people are, what they're responding to. So, so yeah, those are some of the thoughts I had. Thank you, Shalini. Jennifer, then Pam. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent suggestion about um, you know, getting having students participate, which is, you know, can be hard to do. But so I was going to say whether um, Sally Lenowski at um, the <laughs> off campus, yeah, she could really help us reach out to students. And they actually have some Zoom meetings with students in August. So working with her, we could, since it's Zooming in, we could reach out during the summer and also have something when the students are here. But she will be very helpful with that. Thank you for that. Um, Pam and then John. Yes, I agree with Jennifer. Um, I, I wrote down Sally Lenowski um, for a couple of reasons because we had, uh, there was a really wonderful document that Michelle Miller put together or, or found from State College or something that helps talk about being good renters, being good neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. Really wonderful um, program that's 
that they run there. And I think it would be great to start sort of greasing the skids for getting that kind of thing going by engaging Sally and, and her students. Um, I would like, just for the record, I would like to have UMass be required to track where their students live off campus. They try to do that, but it is not a requirement. And I think, um, I just think that would be something that would give us a whole lot more information on, uh, you know, especially just population in Amherst. So however we can marry up those different needs would be great. Thank you. We're going to do John, Pat, and then um, Jennifer just took her hand out. Jennifer, it's like someone else did. And then we're going to actually move on to Shalini's spreadsheet because that that's where sort of this conversation is already sort of trending. Um, but John, Pat, then Jennifer. Yeah, I was going to say that um, we can get students into a Zoom meeting. Um, they they're know how to do that. They're fine doing it. We already do that. Um, and and what you were saying about um, you know doing that outreach to to students, we do that. Um, we've been doing that for a couple of years, and we've been doing it. We used to do it in person, then we started doing it on Zoom um, during the the lockdown and the pandemic for um, you know new renters in neighborhoods. So we meet with them, we lay out, um, we talk about what the neighborhood is like, um, we lay out the expectations and. They love showing up at a Zoom meeting because you can do it at 10 o'clock in the morning. They come with their cereal. They, um, you know, they're perfect. Thank you, John. Pat, then Jennifer. Yeah, John, that was good to hear. Uh, but I'm not wanting students there to explain to them how they should behave and what the neighborhood's like. I want to hear their experience as renters so that that's informing this bylaw. And I just want to make sure that that's clear. Uh, I've been in my own district in the meetings where we've met with students and, and landlords and stuff, and they're excellent, and it really is helpful. So I'm not diminishing them, but that's not what this should be about. Thank you, Pat. Jennifer. You're muted. Sorry. Um, I wasn't thinking of them coming so we could talk to them. I think I want to hear what they have to say because the... I mean, if they're properties that aren't well maintained, they're the ones that are, so we definitely need to hear from them. So that that would be why we'd want them. But I I'm, I was actually talking with Tony Morales, Morales yesterday, and he said that they are, they have started asking where students are living and tracking off campus, you know, where they, so I think, Dan won't put words in his mouth, but I think. But not 100%. 100, yeah, okay. Okay. We're gonna move on to Shalini's, um, Excel spreadsheet. Um, this is the tab for rental registration that she has um, begun oh, yeah. uh, drafting, proposing, and then filling out. Um, I, I want to say thank you to Shalini for starting this. Uh, uh, Pam and Jennifer may not know, and I don't know how much Pat knows, but Shalini on CRC has been pushing for, I think, the entire time she's been on CRC, so nearly four years. Um, to find a way to do outreach in a way that is not um, too overly burdensome on the committee members, but is more standardized so that it can almost be implemented on a much more regular basis so that we know what we're getting and how we're doing it and all. And I have worked with Shalini to try and um, get her to get these into the right places, um, which is why I'm thrilled she's on TSO because I kept saying outreach, that's the committee. Uh, but I've worked with her in CRC to, to try and do this on multiple occasions with, with various things, including our comprehensive housing policy where we did a little bit, but not much. Um, and so I just wanna say it's been a long road to even get to this point and I know it's not finished and I know TSO has not talked about it, but I wanna just give a shout out to all the work you've done and the, continued emphasis you've put on finding a way for the council to be able to do outreach in a um, more concerted um, and doable manner that can potentially be tracked and thought of and implemented in, in many different ways. So we've got a draft of this. I don't want us to deal with steps one, two, or three at all today. 
they are not filled in. We will talk about them at some point, but I'm going to have Shalini try to start filling them in and come back at a next meeting with them already populated, at least in the answers section and potentially even all the way over. So we have something to talk about so that we can get through it in a um, frankly, a more efficient manner than trying to, as a group, answer all the questions with them starting blank. Um, but what I do want us to talk about, because if we're moving to um, a public forum or dialogue, or I'm still not sure what we're going to call it for the 25th, and it sounds like everyone's okay with July 25th, um, I'll make sure there's no problems with that with the rest of council leadership and staff and all. Um, it would be good to start getting questions out there now to be able to have potentially surveys out there now, even if we don't know who they might go to, to have a, a CRC agreement on questions to ask people um, sooner rather than later so that maybe we can have some of those responses back before the 25th that might inform the questions we want to ask on the 25th and what we want to pose on the 25th. So that's why I want to focus on this step four engagement with the questions to ask. Shalini has come up with some potential ones with some splits between who might answer which ones, specifically to those who are renting out property, um, those who are renting property, and those who are neither of those. So residents in Amherst that neither rent property or or rent property. So so basically, I guess that's like owners or visitors or those that want to live here um, and things like that. And what type of questions we might want to have answers to to get an idea of things. So that's what's on the screen. I will make it a little bigger. Thank um, you. <laughs> I'm I'm going to try and oh there what, I didn't close uh, hold on by doing that it thought I closed the window um I'm going to make it bigger and see if I can actually track changes and I don't know in here whether I can but um, I will type the changes anything we have on here we've got about ten minutes to begin this conversation before we have to go on to minutes um, and a ZBA update but but we'll, we'll see what we can do with it. Jennifer. Um, yeah, I, I did have a little, um, so the first question on what's your lived experience of renters? So that, I think, it's, I, I think it's great to get feedback about how people feel about renting and those who have rental units, what their experience is, but that question felt a little um, anti-renter to me. So that, because, you know, again, I know I've said this before, but really living in a neighborhood with a lot of renters, it, it's the, the issues are particularly with absentee owned student renters. And it's not like people said, always the rent, the students, it could be the way often, very often, more than not, it's because of how the building is maintained. So it's not renters. It's, and so I feel, I don't, so I don't even know if we need that question. I mean, Unless we're going to designate specifically absentee owned student renters, rental, and it's rentals, it's not renters. I mean, nobody has a problem with renters. I guess that's, so I found that a little, like, why would we, I, I mean, there's no ex experience with renters. Pat, you're muted. I'm sorry. Um, and I couldn't raise my hand functionally before. Um, it seems to me that I would really like to hear, it, <laughs> this is gonna seem contradictory maybe to you, Jennifer, but I, I would like to hear people's experience because I, I have renters near me, student renters and, and other renters. And so I, and I've had very good experiences. I only had one year where I had a bad experience. So I would like to hear more in, an, in a situation where the public is coming together. What is the range of response? I mean, I, I'm not, I know the response, uh, your response. I know uh, Nathan and Pearl Marglitz's um, response because they're living in a, in a situation that's very difficult. But I, I would love to know what people 
who don't rent, but are homeowners are experiencing throughout the town. So I think it is a valuable question. So I've attempted to reword it, um, renters and with renters and rentals in your neighborhood. Um, I don't know whether that's a better wording or not. Um, the red would be deleted. I just can't do strike through in Excel, apparently. <laughs> Jennifer, you're I, muted. I am, yeah. There's families that rent. There's couples, single mm -hmm. people that yeah. rent. And I don't even know that they're renters. I mean, I just, I don't, gen, I don't distinguish between renters and anybody else. But so that, so it just seemed to say, what's your experience with renters? I don't know. That just, that feels like it feels like it's like rent renters. renters. <laughs> Um, Shall Shall people. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, Pat, go ahead. No, no, I, just... I think I when Shalini's unmuted, unmuted we, get we get feedback. feedback. Yes. Okay. 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 Is that no. No. Oh, wait. If Shalini if... mutes, that'll go away. Did it go away? No idea why it's happening, but okay. <laughs> Shalini's for some reason giving us feedback today. What Only... about experience? Yeah, um, go, Pat. What, what's your lived experience of people who rent in, in your neighborhood? I don't know. I mean, I still think it's an important question. So how to shade it? I think your point's important, Jen. Um, but I, I'd like yeah. to get a richer picture of, of people's experience. Shalini? Okay, is this still feedback? Is it better? I don't think we ever had it. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, good. I, okay. Um, yeah, I think that was the intention was to uh, get a sense, all of it, right, of what is actually the lived experiences with renters. I like the change in the language, Mandy Jo, the, of lived experiences with renters and rentals. And I think in the feedback, they might say that, you know, XYZ, because in our district meetings, there were people who uh, had very good experiences with renters and and then and at the same time there were other parts of town where people talked about what they didn't like about um what they were seeing with the renters and so it's like it'll be like a whole mix and that's kind of the idea is not to lead them on but to leave an open um open-ended question to start off with and then we can go more specific okay what do you love about it what are the challenges? And then go into more specifics. Jennifer. I'm just gonna say this one, one last time, but um, it's probably, no, it probably won't be the last time, but um, just, as I live in an RG neighborhood. So we have, we already have multifamily houses. We have, there are lots of people that rent here and we're not othering students, but they're, is just, I mean, nobody thinks twice about renters. So it's fine to ask renters what they feel about renting here because whether they're students or not, and because we're trying to strengthen the rental bylaw to make the quality of life better for renters, no matter who they are. But I can't imagine that anybody anywhere in Amherst is concerned that there are people renting and the people are paying rent instead of paying a mortgage they're the, what they're concerned about is very specific so i just want to get that out there pat then shalini okay jennifer can keep talking because you made me realize that every time i see renters i add the label student renters okay so um but I still think this question is important. So if there was some way, and I, I don't know what the way is, and, 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 but, it, but I think we all have to acknowledge generally, I think all of us think about student renters. I don't, I don't think about the family across the way who's renting. I'm thinking about student renters. Right. So I think so we're not, we don't offend them. We should, that's what I'm concerned about thinking. Yeah, yeah, I think it's valid. But so how do we get the rich picture of all kinds? Yeah. Shalini and then Stephanie. Well, maybe we can let Stephanie go first. Oh, Stephanie. 
Um, I, this has nothing to do with energy efficiency, but I'm just thinking about your challenge here. What about asking a question of, are you a renter or are you, or are just, are you a renter? So identifying the questions as living in the neighborhood rather than, you know, those who are renters and those who aren't in the neighborhood, somehow it has a little bit of an us and them quality to the questioning. And maybe you can make, you know, merge the, the groups with just basic questions and then just the question of, are you a renter in this neighborhood or not? I don't know. I'm just trying to find a way to help you here. <laughs> I don't know if that was helpful at all. And I, I think that might be. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Actually, thank you, Stephanie, for bringing that up. And uh, the way we were thinking of creating the Google Doc is to start off with the question that, are you a renter? Or a, a land, or a you know, or a, a land. I don't know, landlord or whatever, or uh, live in, or a neighbor or something like that. And so, so it, and then the it would take them to the to the uh, survey that's relevant to them as a neighbor. And we were kind of trying to understand what is experience as a neighbor, as a renter, and as a landlord and try, trying to keep the questions as parallel as possible. So as a renter, what is my experience? And then as a neighbor, what is my experience? And then as a landlord. So all the questions is sort of some sort of parallel. Um, and I think the next question is, what do you love about living in a neighborhood? So it's kind of shows that it's not, we're not necessarily saying it's all bad. So the idea is that if you don't know what is what are the challenges that neighbors have? I think part of this is education and awareness in the whole community that this is what we love about having different renters. And this is where we feel a little challenged about. And there's nothing wrong about saying uh, that if I have a young kid and there are kids in my on my lane playing beer pong naked, I have a little challenge. They're not naked, but you know, like whatever. So yeah, they're having fun, but it's okay to have a dialogue around that at some point. I don't know if that'll go into the rental registration, but I think part of all of this is just also creating that awareness. And then how can we use the rental registration bylaw to improve the quality of life of people where possible? Okay, so I wanna move us off question number one so that we sort of think about the rest of the questions. Thank you, Stephanie, for the suggestion there. Um, we're we're going to come back with potentially a way to do this and maybe a survey or a form that that combines all of this. But, you know, as you can see, most of the questions are fairly parallel. Um, are there other questions on a survey like this or a, a Google form or however it's going to be done that that committee members would like to see um, that that might be missing from something like this? Um, Pam, and then I'm going to go to Stephanie because her hand is still up just in case she has something else to say. So um, if we're trying to keep these parallel um, under the renters one, question number three is, I, if I'm trying to compare, it's what are the challenges of living in your neighborhood? You know, what are the challenge? That, that is a different question than living in your rental because rental might be condition of, you know, the, the bathrooms or something. So this is, really we're trying to get in your in your neighborhood yeah i i noticed that too yet at the same time i would actually like to ask the question about living in a rental um like that particular rental right which i think might parallel something we might be able to ask the property owners who are renting um you know it's not quite here but there might be a parallel to that of what are the challenges of um, maintaining or whatever you're, you know, managing a rental property in Amherst or something like that. Um, yep. So, but, but make it a separate question. Okay. Right. So let's see if I can. Yeah. Thank you for that. Catching that. Yeah. Cause they had two separate questions. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I don't know how the spreadsheet's set up. So and would people be okay with um, adding in sort of that question about for the landlords, the sort of parallel one of what are the challenges of maintaining a property, yeah. your rental property in Amherst or something mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. 
Mm -hmm. Well, Mandy just typing. Are there other questions? Yeah. Do we want demographics or certain things? We don't want it to be too long and cumbersome, but. I need to think about it a little more. I, you know, like what would I really like to ask them? So I think what I'm going to try and do for the next meeting is combine this into some sort of actual survey we might be able to look at the survey with. Um, so that we can see what it would look like. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, I, I don't know whether I can do that in a way that can make it into a packet or not. Um, so I'll, I'll think about that for the next meeting. But uh, Jennifer, other potential questions? No, but I think I, I honed in on what is kind of getting, um, I'm trying to get at is distinguishing between renters and residents because renters are residents. Yeah. Okay. Non-renting non residents. Yep. Well, uh, we'll figure something out between now and the next meeting. <laughs> Anything else you wanna say before we move on to the rest of our agenda? Um, Pam. Yeah, very quickly. Um, this definitely should not be a questionnaire like the dementia and aging question, which was like 40 pages long, just not appropriate. I envision no more than like four pages, but not even that. And mm -hmm. I. I I mean, we've got what I think I can do is combine these into five or six questions. Um, what I don't know whether I can do, depending on which one I'm using, is whether, depending on how they answer, say, a question about whether they rent or own or rent property in Amherst to others, whether I can remove questions or add questions into that so they see or don't see potentially relevant questions. Um, so um, we'll track that. Shalini is going to work on one, two, and three, filling that out for next time too. Pam. So I think, I mean, if we really are truly thinking about questions, it, it really should be uh, relative to step one, like what are the issues we want to address and, mm -hmm. and ask them things related to um, inspections and related to, um, you know, staffing needs or something like that, or penalties for health violations. I mean, those are the kinds of things that if we're truly trying to get some feedback, um, it, it might want to ask questions like that. Okay. Yeah, and I think the, uh, so there are two types of questions. One is you, because if you ask very specific questions and it leads the respondents into thinking in a particular way and not think about their other experience. So I think starting with like these more general questions yeah. gives us rich data, but then we could have the second page which would be more like specifics that are optional that they can rate or something like that how happy or and then a comments with that but then also i think there's a way to have three separate surveys so that people don't see all the questions and they just say like if you're a renter click here and then if you're a, you know a resident whatever. well i'm going to explore whether we can do that just through tagging certain questions depending on how a previous question was answered and sending to different pages on one survey so that the link is the same for everyone, which makes sending out a link easier. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's what I'm gonna explore. Um, so that they don't see, you know, if they don't rent property out in Amherst, they have no need to see any question related to maintenance issues with being a property owner who rents, you know. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna see if I can figure out a way to do that because I'm pretty sure I can. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's possible. So Even the question here. is, yes. can I do it? So mm -hmm. we're going to move on. Um, ZBA appointment recommendations update. Pam, I think the update basically is we still don't have additional applicants. So there's a deadline of next Tuesday to submit statements of interests. Jennifer. I've emailed two people. I'm working on them. <laughs> so we, oh, Pam, we do have one update, which is we have determined of the current terms who are ending who is sitting on current zba yep. cases and so that motion will be in front of us no matter what in two weeks um, to make a recommendation to the council um, to keep those individuals on those matters extend their terms till those matters finish um, 
so it was done last year. Um, there's there's a motion, but we've now got that information, Pam. Is there, so Pam is, was able to get that. And so that will be on the 23rd? We'll have that motion for a recommendation on the 23rd. You've sent me the draft language. I haven't reviewed it totally. Um, we're not dealing with it today because of, I, if we're doing interviews on the 23rd, which is the plan, there is the potential that one of those people may be recommended for full appointment and therefore may not need to be part of the extend the terms for certain matters. And maybe we'll get others that are currently terms ending and we can convince them to apply again. So um, it's, it's always good to do them all at the same time. Good. Jennifer. Oh, I guess it won't come, but there is a ZBA meeting on the 23rd that'll start at six if we're gonna be, but we could interview them before if we have anybody that's currently on the board. We're starting at 4.30. And so yeah. the interviews should be done. We'll make sure those interviews are done. So. Um, yeah, Shalini. Do we also want to come up with a future? And I, I don't know if that's covered in our agenda or it's a future discussion item. But like, what happened last time? Do we need a process in place that if we last minute there is a cancellation or withdrawals? Is that a future agenda item? That's a future agenda item, um, and it might end up being a recommendation to change the policy to the council because we're operating under a council adopted policy. So um, we'll have to look at the current policy and whether any discussion on future agenda regarding what happened requires a policy change or not, or whether it fits within a policy, depending on what we discuss. So okay. that's future agenda item. Uh, and I, I did send an email out. Okay. We're gonna move on to minutes. And I'm just going to make a motion um, to adopt the May 26, 2022 meeting minutes and the June 2nd, 2022 special meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. second. <laughs> <laughs> We've got multiple seconds. Any comments? No. Seeing none, we're going to go to a vote. Shalini. Yes. Uh, Pat. Aye. Mandy's an aye. Pam. Yes. Jennifer? Yes. That is unanimous. I don't have any other announcements. Um, the next agenda preview is basically, depending on how many SOIs come in, will depend on how much goes on next agenda beyond ZBA interviews. It's that simple. Um, so we'll see how many SOIs come in and I'll make a determination as to how long that part of the meeting might take. And then we'll guess some other things for the agenda. Uh, anything else before I adjourn? Shalini. Very quickly, uh, if people have ideas of who we can reach out to for the different, um, you know, whatever, uh, or channels or people or other things, can they send it to me or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That would be amazing. And that will help me fill up the chart. Thank you. With that, I'm adjourning the meeting at 6.32 PM. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye.